All right, I'm going to give you my abbreviated testimony. If I gave you the full testimony, we'd be here long into the night. <laughs> so many of you know this already, but some of you don't. And it's good for us to give our testimonies, not just to build up others, but to remind ourselves of who's and how we've come to be, who we are and how we've come to be in the faith. And so, um, as many of you know, I was baptized by my Monsignor uncle, a Roman Catholic, as an infant. And we went to the Catholic Church periodically. And my parents separated when I was eight, and my mother's family had always been Episcopalian. So we went to the Episcopal Church pretty regularly. But it didn't mean much to me. It was more of a routine experience of going to church. It wasn't bad necessarily, but it was somewhat boring, I thought, and just didn't really speak to my sense of what was relevant in my life at the time. Uh, one thing led to another. I ended up going to military school. And while I was in military school, uh, the first day I went through the line, which everybody had to go through, where you got your gear, your books, where you'd be staying, which barracks, all of that. And there was a person with a clipboard in a military uniform with a cross lapel on his uniform. He was unique in that way. No one else had the cross. And I noticed it. And when I got to him, he asked me my name and asked me what my religious affiliation was. And I said, Episcopalian, I guess. That's where my parents took me. And he said, you know, you're the first Episcopalian student I've seen all day. Through all these cadets, you're the first one. And you're going to be my acolyte. <laughs> it turns out he was not just the chaplain at the military school, but he was also what's called the vicar of the Little Episcopal Church in this little town of Boonville, Missouri. So every Sunday morning, all the cadets would line up on the blacktop in uniform and then be marched to their various churches that they were connected to. You had to go to church. It was compulsory. If you were Jewish, you were marched to the temple, which was actually a car ride about five towns away. Uh, but everyone else marched into town. And so I marched into town. Every Sunday, I didn't have a choice in the matter. I was drafted as an acolyte, but I had the best time. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember my first Sunday, I had the acolyte cincture on, and it was dragging like three feet behind me, and I kept tripping on it. So anytime you guys serve with me, you know I'm totally sympathetic to that issue. That's why I'm not real strict about how to tie it exactly. As long as it's not dragging, you're okay. I didn't really understand, though, what the point of this was, except I remember that the people were extremely loving, they served up a lot of coffee with sugar in it, <laughs> donuts, and it was a real change from the very Spartan, harsh environment of the military school, such that I couldn't wait to go to church just to be in the fellowship. And I know you relate to that. There's something very beautiful about the fellowship of Christians, even if you don't understand what it is that animates them exactly. I just was drawn to it. And in the midst of that, I would meet with the chaplain on occasion, and he could tell I was a bit of a lost soul spiritually, and he said to me, let me tell you my story. I was in Vietnam, and I was wounded badly, and I was going on a gurney into the hospital room and the surgical suite to be uh, operated on, and as I was going in, a nurse I didn't know came up to me, and she put her hand on my shoulder, and she said, Christ is the answer. And he said, I went into surgery, came out, woke up, and the doctors couldn't understand how I had what appeared to be a miraculous healing. Now, he didn't give me specifics about what he meant by that, but he was totally convinced that this is what happened. And he asked for the nurse. No nurse. He described her in this Saigon hospital, and no one knew who she was. So that was the beginning of his spiritual growth. And so he said to me, who is Jesus Christ to you, Joe? Of course, I said, I don't know. And he said, Christ is the answer. The answer for what you're looking for. But at the time, I wasn't consciously looking for anything specifically, but he could see in me the spiritual emptiness that he knew Christ longed to fill and was filling in that moment. So I graduated from military school, went to college, went to church once in a while. I remember going to a Sunday evening service at this Episcopal Cathedral, and after about two weeks, they discovered that I was sort of becoming a regular, and they wanted to get to know me, and I bolted. I would you like to come out to dinner with us? We've got a college fellowship. He said, you know what? I can't. I, can't. I wanted it on my terms, right? I wanted to come and experience kind of the peace and then not make any commitment at all. So I played that game for a little bit. And then uh, stopped going to church because they knew me. And I didn't want to make any deeper connection than they already saw in me. So I didn't talk to the chaplain much at all. It had been about three years since I talked to him, actually. And 
I was at the point in my college career where I had options of what I could do, and I had three specific areas that, that I thought might be interesting to me by way of a career. But the problem was, I didn't know which one to go with. So, I took a walk on the night of May 25th, 1992, 7.02 p.m. I took a walk, and I said, God, if you're listening, <laughs> tell me which area I'm supposed to go into which will determine the career of my life. No answer. But I remember it was a very foggy night, and on the street there were like these old-fashioned <laughs> gas light lights, and I remember looking at them, thinking, oh, I guess I just don't, I don't know. So I went back into my room, I was getting ready to turn in for the night, and all of a sudden, it was like a wind came through me. And a still, small voice said, you will be a priest. Mm -hmm. Because that wasn't one of the three options, <laughs> I found that most unusual. And so I thought, I, that's weird. You know, I, I must be desperate, reaching for things that aren't there. So I went to bed. Woke up the next day, something was different. I went to the grocery store, and I remember this. I had to get some things. I was going through the checkout line, and the person who was at the checkout counter was just doing their usual thing. I was just like, <laughs> Life's amazing, isn't it? It's a great day. <laughs> this person just like, <laughs> and I realized what's going on with me. And now I can say I had joy. I don't think I had joy before. You know, happiness is an up and down, fleeting emotion. Joy is different, and I think I had joy, but I had no understanding why, because I had no spiritual growth. Was the stuff? Sorry. You started that in that It just point. started. It was a seed. A seed had been planted by many people over a long time, clearly. But here's the problem, or the challenge, or the opportunity, however you look at it. I didn't know what to do. So I called the chaplain. And I felt a bit sheepish and embarrassed that I hadn't kept up with him. I'd been very fond of him, but I just had neglected our relationship. So I called him. He was totally cool guy. He said, hey, Joe, I've been waiting for this call. I said, you mean the call to the priesthood or the phone call reconnecting? He said, yes. I said, well, here's the thing. I don't really go to church, and I don't really know anything. I'll admit that to you, Chapel Bill. I don't really know anything. And he said, well, it's time you started to grow. And it was very much a situation of the cart being before the horse, because most of the people I met in seminary, and maybe a lot of you can relate to this, they were growing in the faith, and then they eventually discerned a call to the ministry, maybe, or something. But in my case, it was completely opposite. I had to learn everything and grow. And the point is, it's not human effort. We do the footwork, but God does the growing. As the Bible says, some plant, some water, God does the growing. So I didn't have a Bible. But I did have this. This is not the original one, but it's a copy. I had, from my confirmation, the Book of Common Prayer. <laughs> Why? I have no idea. Every time I moved, I brought it with me. Never read it, never opened it. So Bill said, Chaplain Bill said, why don't you open it up to page 415? You know, where you made your vows when you were confirmed? <laughs> I'm like, okay. So what does it say? Do you renew your commitment to Jesus Christ? I do, and with God's grace, I will follow him as my Savior and Lord. I thought, wow, I said that. <laughs> it didn't really make a difference in my life, I don't think. <laughs> or did it? There was a deep seed planted, and the bishop laid hands on me, as he does for all those that he or she confirms. The Holy Spirit is called down to take that which occurred in baptism and to bring it into fruition, to further growth. So I thought, wow, there's a lot of this prayer book. Let's see here. So then I looked at the catechism, which Father Bill told me to look at. And he told me to look specifically at page 853, where it says, question, how do we recognize the truths taught by the Holy Spirit? Answer, we recognize truths to be taught by the Holy Spirit when they are in accord with the scriptures. So I thought I better get a Bible. <laughs> so I got a Bible. And I started to read, and I read John's Gospel, and it blew me away. I thought, I didn't know any of this. This Jesus, he's amazing. I want to know him better. 
and I recommitted my life to Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's where I'll stop the testimony for now because there's plenty more to say, but I went off to seminary. Uh, one thing though, I will say about that first month at seminary is I got to the seminary and there was a huge banner <clears throat> on the side of the seminary building and it said, Billy Graham Crusade, Pittsburgh Free River Stadium on such and such date. And this guy's like, we're going, man. <laughs> and I'm like, Billy Graham, he's not an Episcopal church. Why is this thing up there? I had a lot to learn about spiritual growth. So I went to the Three River Stadium, the old stadium, and I heard Billy Graham. And I, it, again, just totally blessed me hearing what he had to say. And I realized there's a big world out there. And I have a lot to grow in and learn. And the thing about Billy Graham, and we spoke about this this morning during the 10 o'clock service, he died today. He uh, started out as a fire and brimstone preacher, which for that context was appropriate. It is in some cases. And at the end of his life, he said, I wish I had spoken more about God's love. So here's a man who lived to be 99, who was the pastor to the presidents, pastor to Queen Elizabeth, a good friend of hers apparently, who said, I wish I'd talked more about love. So he grew. His spiritual growth was such that even at the end of his life, he realized he had a lot more growing to do. Doesn't that say a lot? So we're all growing. And in this night and in the nights to come in the next few weeks, I want to hear more from you about how you grow spiritually. I'll share more about how I do. And John, I'm going to turn it over to you.